Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. It's good to see you. Hope everybody's doing well. I'm excited to continue in the second week of our teaching series, It Doesn't Make Sense, where we're talking about and discussing things related to emotional and mental and behavioral health. And Pastor Joby did a great job, as always, last weekend, setting up the heart and the why behind this series and why it's so important in the life of our church. And uh, just praying that God's going to continue to speak to us today. But before we keep swimming in the deep end, I do want to be one of the first to say happy Thanksgiving to you. Happy Thanksgiving. I hope you have a great one. Hope you have meaningful things experienced. If you will, just look over at your neighbor, give them a fist bump and tell them happy Thanksgiving. At all of our campuses, fist bumps. If you're online, you can put a fist bump in the chat if you want to. All right, look at your neighbor now and I want you to tell them what is your favorite Thanksgiving food? What is your favorite food for Thanksgiving? Tell your neighbor. Don't lie and tell them salad. All right. I hope that I heard, I hope that many people said macaroni and cheese in Jesus' name. It's the best. It's the best. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to imagine in your mind's eye that you're sitting at your Thanksgiving table with hopefully your loved ones or people that, <clears throat> that mean a lot to you. You're sitting there at the table and you look down at your plate of food. Why is your plate of food organized the way that it is? You ever think about that? Why, it, does you, do you allow for the different foods to touch each other? Or do you keep them separate? Do you just pile it all on because it's all going to the same place anyway and then cover it in gravy? Right? My family growing up, gravy was a love language. You know, we just put it on everything. Do you have your salad on the main plate or is it on a separate dish? Are you one of those weirdos that eats your salad after you eat the main course? You should see somebody about that. Why do you make those choices? Why do you organize it the way you do? Why do you uh, practice that habit over and over and over again subconscious to yourself? Where did you learn how to do that? Why is that your instinct or your preference? This is what we're going to talk about today is why we so often do the things that we do on a subconscious level and where that comes from. Over the last year as a church more than now, we've been rooted deep in John chapter 10 verse 10. And in John 10, Jesus extends an invitation where he says, I have come that they would live, up, that you, they would have life abundantly. And he's invited us into the fullest and healthiest and whole version of life. And Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He is the one who can provide eternal life and a full life here on earth. And we've been wrestling with what this means. And a couple of things before we continue on about our church is that one, normally when you would come to church here, maybe you're out from out of town visiting or you're with family for the holidays, you're welcome and we're glad you're here. I'm not normally the person that preaches here, I just get the opportunity to do it this weekend and normally Pastor Joby, our lead pastor, preaches and he's way better looking than I am and so you have that to look forward to next time. And secondly, normally when we teach the Bible, we go book by book and verse by verse and I love that about our church. But today is going to be a little bit different because I'm going to do today mostly in the form of testimony. And I'm going to share my testimony. And a part of what I've walked through in regards to growth and, and challenges and some dark times in regards to mental and emotional and behavioral health. Because the truth is that I've experienced many different days in my life that the church fathers would call the dark nights of the soul or the melancholy. Uh, I, I've had seasons of my life where I felt overcome with anxiety. I've had panic attacks. Last one was in 2020. Uh, I've had those days where it felt like just getting my feet out of the bed and onto the floor was a significant accomplishment. And on some of those days, it was. And, and I've grown through this, and so I offer this in the form of testimony and some of the things that God has been teaching me and God has been gently leading me into, and I, I hope that somehow God would use this in the life of our church and in some of your lives as an encouragement, and that God would speak to us through some of the things that, that he's taught me. And as I've thought a lot about John chapter 10 over the last year and the abundant life that Jesus offers us, 
There's a scripture in the New Testament, if you fast forward a little bit, in Galatians chapter 5, where Jesus, uh, where the Apostle Paul writes about these character traits, these outworkings of the work of God in the life of the believer. And he writes it like this in Galatians chapter 5. This is how Paul gives a framework for what the abundant life is from the inside out. He says the fruit. Notice he doesn't say the feeling. He says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. So there's something that God is at work in our life, and he, he is growing these traits, these motivational uh, these, these motivations in our life that are, that are love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness, gentleness, faithfulness and self-control. And when you read that, it sounds awesome, doesn't it? Who doesn't want that? Who doesn't want that to be the thing that marks their decision making? That, that doesn't that want that to be the thing that marks their relationships? That this is what your life is full of, both thinking and behaving. I find myself at a crossroads a handful of years ago where I believe with everything that I can muster that the abundant life is found in and through Jesus and that this is what God wants to grow in my life. But I had this real challenge that there was a far cry from the abundant life as I understood it and my actual life as I experienced it. Because my actual life was not filled with these things. My actual life was filled with tension. I felt it in my body. Many nights would be sleepless. Uh, my appetite would come and go. Uh, I felt tension in my relationships, primarily in my relationship to myself. I regularly felt frustrated. I felt frustrated with myself that I couldn't just do better. I thought if I would just do better, then all of a sudden I would feel better. That if I could just change one or two circumstances in my life, and then maybe my life and the way that I felt about it would change. I had a lot of anxiety, and I don't say that word lightly. I know there's all different kinds of anxiety that people face in their life, and there are some people who really never struggle with any version of anxiety, and praise God for that. And then there's other people that walk through different kinds of anxiety that are circumstantial based on the events of your life, and, and those can be really challenging times. And then there's other folks that have physiological diagnoses and, and mood disorders where doctors and professionals are a part of your life for the course of your life as you are on the front lines of the battle against anxiety. And wherever you fall on that spectrum, more than anything, what I want for you today is to hear these words that God loves you. I want you to hear and to believe that God loves you, that God is near to the brokenhearted, that God is near us when we're on the mountaintops and when we're in the valleys. He is faithful and he loves his children. And as I walked through these, the, these days and weeks of, of anxiety, it, it often led to disappointment and, and feelings of hopelessness at times. In, in my life, I felt this angst underneath the surface where it just felt like everything was bubbling on 10. And I was doing everything I could to keep these negative feelings underneath the surface, hoping that they didn't just seep out and land on the people that I loved. And I, honestly, I wasn't doing a very good job. I always felt hurried, just driving like a bat out of hell. Well, that hadn't really changed much. But just always hurried. I remember my kids were small. We'd be walking down the sidewalk, going nowhere, just out for a walk, and I'd be 10 feet out in front of them. Why? Where am I trying to get so fast? What is it that I'm trying to, to do? Why am I so hurried inside? And, and the truth is that my actual life, the experience was regularly joyless. And as I came to this crossroads between the abundant life and, and my actual life as I was experiencing it, I, I, I would wonder, why the gap? Why was there so much space between what I believed could be true and what I felt and experienced? Why the slow or no growth? Why did what I want feel so far from who I was? And as I began to think about this, I got very focused on my feelings. And I thought that if I could just do better, then things would get better. And what I've learned, and I'm still in the process of learning, is that every feeling I've ever had in my life comes from a thought. And I thought in my life that the issue was pressure. That if I could just relieve some pressure, then I would feel better. And, and the responsibilities I had, like my job and my family and my kids, these responsibilities, they often felt like burdens instead of like gifts. And this was my normal experience. And I just wasn't able to enjoy the gifts in my life regularly. It seemed like I was just stuck. 
And it's important to note that at this time, there was really no blatant sin issue going on in my life. It wasn't like I was yelling at people regularly. It wasn't like I was abusing drugs or alcohol or looking at porn or stealing money. None of these blatant external sin issues were, were going on in my life. It was actually quite the opposite. I was trying to work hard. I was, trying to, I was working here as I was beginning to learn and uncover a lot of this stuff and, deal, and, and find myself in a situation to deal with it. I was trying to love my family well. I was trying to provide. I was trying to be a good person. But the truth is, inside of me, I was stuck in discontentment. I was stuck in joylessness and restlessness, and I had been for some time. So what happened? What were the aha moments for me, the, the moments where God grabbed my attention and began to gently lead me in a, in a different direction, of which he still is doing it. Look, I'm gonna, as I tell you this testimony today, I'm going to take really what, things that have happened over the course of 25 years and learnings that were uh, committed to over like six or seven years, and I'm going to try to pack them down into the next, next 30 minutes. And so make no mistake about it that healthy is hard work and that God does his best work over time with his children who trust him. Things just take time as we work through them. There were some aha moments, there were many, but I'll share two with you today where, where I woke up to the reality of what was going on inside me. One is that my wife of 17 years, this has probably been seven or eight years ago now, uh, who loves me, and that's a big part of it, that she loves me and she wants good for me, and I believe that. She's a good woman, she's honorable and respectable in every way, and our kids were small, and one day I come in from work and I'm huffing and I'm puffing and I'm just being heavy. You know, the temperature's rising around me, I'm frustrated with myself, and I'm, so I'm acting frustrated in my life, and, and she stops me in the kitchen, and she's just like, hey, Ryan, I love you, but you are completely joyless. You are making life way harder on us than it has to be, and something has to change. And as soon as she said it, I couldn't even defend myself, because she was right. I've learned through this process that when someone who loves you looks at you and gives you direct feedback, calls you on your junk, the best practice is just to shut your mouth and listen. So one, my wife, whom I love and loves me, says, you're completely joyless. That got my attention. The second was that my father died. He had been sick for a very, very long time. And when he died, I felt these, what I can only explain as a deep sense of relief. And it wasn't I was relieved because my father and I had a bad relationship. That wasn't the case at all. I loved my dad very much. Uh, I was relieved because he had been sick for a very long time and I had just been bracing emotionally for the impact. You see, I buried my mom 20 years earlier and I never really dealt with any of that grief. I never really had anywhere for all of those emotional experiences and for all of that trauma, honestly, to go. And so I had just been holding on to it for two decades and having to relive disease unto death again, I did not know what to do and I did not know where to put these emotions. And so what I did was I just shoved them down. And this is the emotional equivalent of taking a 1,000 pound dumbbell, sticking it in a book bag, and then trying to go run a marathon, call it your life. So when my dad died, all of a sudden there was this explosion of like pressure off of my life because I'd just been waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting on this moment. And the thing about it that got my attention was it scared me and what, what, what caught my, my, my mind's eye was this, was I had no idea I was carrying all that weight around. It was just my normal. I had been living that life so long that I had no idea that I was carrying that kind of weight around. So around this time, I'm studying the scriptures, and, and God leads me to Matthew chapter 15, verses 10 through 8, and, and it says this, and he spoke to me through it. Verse 10, it says, and he, Jesus called the people to him and said to them, hear and understand. Yes, Jesus, I will try to do that. Thank you very much. Hear and understand. It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles a person. And then the disciples came and said to him, do you not know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? One of the things that I've had to get really comfortable with in my relationship with Jesus is that I've got to be okay with him offending me sometimes. He, he does his best work way underneath the surface, and when he gets in there, the surgery's always worth it. He says, do you know the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? And verse 13, Jesus replies, he says, every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone, they are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, 
explain the parable to us. And Jesus said, are you still without understanding? In verse 17, he says, do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? Jesus doing potty talk here, you know. <laughs> do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. Three things that God illuminated to me through this text. Number one, that for me, the issues and the challenges and that I was facing, the unhealth in my life is, didn't have anything to do with what was happening outside of me or, or really anything to do with what others were doing or not doing, that my opportunities for growth were inside. Number two, while this text, Matthew 15, is contextually about legalism and Pharisees, it was obvious to me that I, in the case of me, was the blind leading the blind. If I were able to lead myself to a healthier place, I would have done it by now. But I, in the case of me, I was the blind leading the blind and I could not take my place myself somewhere that I had never been before. I needed help. And number three, that there were things growing inside of me that did not come from my heavenly father. And they needed to be found, they needed to be named, and they needed to be dealt with. Verse 13, Jesus says, every plant that my heavenly father has not planted will be rooted up. And so if there are these weeds growing in my life, and they seemingly are growing at a speed faster than the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So if tension and anxiety are growing faster and my life experiences is fueling these things, what they're doing is they're choking out the joy and the love and the peace and the patience that God is growing in in my life. And so there's a competition going on inside of me and these weeds were growing fast. And if these things did not come from my heavenly father, where did they come from? So it's about this time I'm teaching at this uh, mini leadership conference and I'm sharing a stage with a lady named Katie Cole and I had, uh, in, in my life back home, I had put myself into some counseling and I'm starting to unearth some things and, and but I'm very early in this, this process of learning and I'm at this conference and one of the questions they ask me, they say, Pastor, how have you found yourself able to stay and practice being healthy in the midst of high demands? And I said, and I answered the question with what I thought was a great answer, right? And the, the, the host kind of moves on, and my friend Katie, she leans over to me, and she's like, hey, um, have you ever read emotion, uh, uh, Emotionally Healthy Discipleship by Peace Cazero? And I was like, no. She, she kind of she gave me the wink, and she's like, you should probably check that out. Evidently, my answer was not one of health. It was one of unhealth. And I, I get this resource, Emotionally Healthy Discipleship, by, by P. Scazzaro, and I begin to dig into it. And it was a tremendously helpful resource for me. I believe it would be the same for you. But one of the things that this book does is that it focuses a lot on family history. And so if there are things growing in my life that did not come from my heavenly father, where did they come from? How about my earthly father? How about my earthly family? And so I, I dug in and I began to use a tool called a genogram. And what a genogram does is it, it helps you to map the people and the pains of your life in a way that they have left a significant mark on your subconscious. And it helps you begin to see patterns and trends and behaviors that might help make sense of some of the things that are going on in your life. And so I spent weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks doing this genogram and working through it. And, and I, I want to share some, some of the results of what I learned through the genogram and how the pains and the people in my life had left significant marks on my subconscious that I wasn't even aware of. And so I want to introduce you to my family. It's important that you know uh, about my family that my grandparents and parents, we lived in very, very, very close proximity to each other. I spent as many nights with, at my grandparents' house as I did at my house. It wasn't like I just saw them on the holidays. I was around these people all the time. Our life was very, very, very close-knit. All of my grandparents were born in what is known as the silent generation. This means they both experienced the Great Depression and the Second World War. My grandfather, he fought in the Second World War in the Pacific. He, he never graduated high school uh, because he had to drop out to work to help provide fam money for his family. And then he got his GED after the war, and then he ended up starting his own business and working and working and working. And so my granddad, he died in 2001 of heart disease. These are some things about my grandfather. Now, when you look at this, you can't think in terms of fair and unfair. You just got to toss that out the window. You can't even think in terms of right and wrong. That's got nothing to do with it. What, what we're thinking about is health and, and unhealth. 
we're thinking about history and impact on the present. And so my grandfather, uh, who's a good man, he grew up in poverty. He always had a jar of cookies on top of his fridge, a huge jar of cookies. And one time I asked him about it, and I'm like, Pop, why do we have all these cookies? And he says, he says I didn't have a cookie, a cookie until I was an adult because we were so poor. And I just refused for that to be my family's experience. So we ate a lot of cookies, <laughs> if you can't tell. And uh, he was perseverant, strong back, strong will. He was, he, he, he was tough as nails one time. Uh, the, the family's out pulling fence on the farm and the barbed wire pops and catches in my pop's eye and he pulls the barbed wire out of his eyeball and dislocates his eyeball, pushes it back in and then he makes everybody finish pulling fence for like another hour before he lets them take him to the doctor. Dude's just different, man. <laughs> them are the brothers that stormed the beaches at Normandy. Different, different. He was deeply committed to his family. He had a healthy fear and reverence for God. He loved this country, but probably rooted largely in how he grew up. My grandfather was emotionally distant. You didn't hear many encouraging things from him. You didn't hear many terms of affection. We would leave his house and we would say almost every time, I love you, Pop, and he would always reply back, thank you. Thank you. I never heard him say the words I love you to anybody. I don't know that I ever heard the word love. And I don't, I don't blame him for that. It just is what it is based on the experience that, that we had. And it probably makes sense based on his life. He was emotionally distanced. He was diabetic and had a heart disease. It was his fifth major that got him his fifth major heart attack. Tough as nails. He was an alpha male. He dominated every room he came into and he was a workaholic. He'd work 17, 18 hours a day at the business. And then he'd come and work 17, 18 hours on the farm. And that's, this was the image of what being a real man was to me. It's the way I saw the filter by which I processed his wife, my grandma, she's still alive. She's 92. She's the sweetest woman you've ever met in your entire life. She speaks with this slow southern drawl. I talked to her on the phone the other night for, 11, for 35 minutes. We said 11 words. It's amazing. <laughs> Tough. During COVID, she was in a 600-square-foot apartment at her senior living facility. She did not leave her room for 16 weeks. Tough. Mentally, she's a servant. She'd do anything for anybody. Faithful to her family. Faithful to God. She's completely set in her ways. There were times in our life where untrue narratives were given to her and she believed them and this, this caused some dissension and she was sad. She has experienced a great deal of loss, is sad. She experienced a great deal of loss throughout the course of her life. It's been very defining. Over here, my granddad, this is on my father's side, he died at 61 years old of early on, onset Alzheimer's. Uh, I know very, he died before I was born. I know very little, which says a lot. Anytime I would ask my father about his father, he would not answer me or he would dismiss with very short sentences. Why? Because my dad did not know how to deal with the pain of the loss of his dad, nor with the dysfunction of their relationship. And so I just learned that you just don't talk about these things. This is just stuff you don't talk about. You just put it close to the chest and you just keep moving. I know very little about him. His wife, my grandma, she was a towering woman. She died in, uh, in year 2000. She was 84 years old. Smart, wicked smart. Super helpful, very influential in our family and in the community. Witty, aggressive. Look, one time, my grandma, she loved some angel food cake. And so she, we're at a meal and she's walking around, she's plopping angel food cake on everybody's plate and she comes to mind. I'm like, no, I'm good, I don't want any. She's like, what? I'm like, I don't, the thing about angel food, it's so rich that my teeth fall out as soon as I smell it. You know what I mean? It's just like, and, and I was like, no, I'm good. And she, she takes like three steps past me. And then she turns around and she says, what's wrong with you, boy? And I'm like, nothing. I just don't want the angel food cake. She takes her teeth out of her mouth. She sets them on the counter and she says, are you a communist? Do you want to fight? That's what she says. <laughs> I still don't know if she was kidding. I don't know. My toothless grandma called me a commie. Unbelievable, man. Unbelievable, you can't make that up, man, that's family. She was impatient, always tapping her foot, always pacing around, always felt like there was somewhere she had to, had to be. My mother, I've shared about her many times at our church, she died of cancer. Uh, she was 42 years old, I was 12 when she was diagnosed, I was 14 when she died. Uh, this series of events and this relationship has been defining of my life on every level imaginable. I can't even, I'm still yet to unpack all the depths of, of what has happened here, but um, she was fun and hopeful. Uh, she was the life of the party. She was empathetic. 
She connected on a heart level with people, including me and my brother, regularly. She was a leader. People looked to her. Um, she, she constantly lived under the pressure to perform. She always felt like she was going to disappoint and that she had to deliver and produce results and that this is where her significance came from. She repressed frustration. I never heard my mom and dad argue, ever. Now you say, well, that sounds pretty great. I say, that's true. The thing is, I brought that expectation into my marriage. We made it about three hours. <laughs> there are lights and there are shadows in our histories. My mom was supportive at all costs. She would do anything at whatever cost to herself for anybody at any time. She never took care of herself, only ever took care of others. And then my dad, he died in, in 2018 of a degenerative brain disease. My grandfather of Alzheimer's, my dad of a, a brain disease called PSP. It's pretty aggressive and wicked. And, and uh, my dad was a wise, intelligent, godly, discerning man, disciplined and faithful. He struggled throughout the course of his life with approval-based anxiety. Me too. My brother too. Should have seen me like 25 minutes ago before I decided to come out here and do this. Right? I didn't think about just getting my truck and go to the Waffle House. That seemed like a better option. And I thought about it, and I thought, well, if they all think I'm jacked up, the good news is they're all jacked up too. And so we'll all be, we'll all be jacked up together. My dad was codependent on my mom, no question about it. Uh, he, he made the decision five months after my mom died to get remarried. He remarried quickly, and this was a very formative thing. I love my stepmom. She's fantastic. She's a wonderful woman, but that was a challenging season. He was conflict avoidant, and he was defined by his early failures. So as you look at my family history, what are some things that stand out to you? What just jumps right off the page? Well, it's that almost everybody is dead. Almost everybody is dead. And what I've found is that grief, the way I experienced these deaths was as a rejection, at least in part, as a rejection. I felt rejected by God. I felt rejected by life. Sometimes unfairly, I would even put that on them as if they had anything to do with it. At the, at the core of my subconscious, the foundation of my life, there were some thoughts that began to form as the result of these experiences. And these thoughts became very shaping and became very defining. They still are very much fighting to be the filter by which I see and experience life. So they get seeded down in my subconscious and in my guts and they begin to grow weeds and these weeds become the filter by which I process all of life and all relationships. Two thoughts that were formed in me that I'll share with you. Thought number one is that suffering and loss is just around the corner. The suffering and loss is just around the corner. So if, if you believe that to be true, how do you live your life? Bracing for impact. You build emotional walls to protect yourself from people because when they're gone, it won't hurt as bad. Thought number two, pain is what makes you matter. This is a statement of significance. This is an identity statement. You begin to think that the more that you can tolerate pain and the more pain that you can get through and that you just need to be tougher. If you can just be tougher then then maybe you will, you will matter more. This was an identity statement. If you think you will lose what you love at any time and you believe that your purpose in life is to suffer, then what grows out of that? Fear does. I have found in my life that all of my unhealthy tendencies, all, for me, all of my instincts, the powerful emotions that have been at work in my life just beneath the surface created in me a shadow self. So, so some, I, there's the person that I was trying to project in the world, the person that I want you to think that I am, and the person that I actually am, and the person that I actually am so often in my life was, was, was uh, wrought with fear and with anxiety and with misplaced worry. The shadow self that forms through our life experiences is real. It's scary when we realize it, and it absolutely must be uncomfort, uncovered if we want to grow in health. These are not my words. These are words that you'll hear uh, regularly if you study any version of Christ-centered emotional and behavioral health. Now, as I'm learning, here's my dilemma. I can tell you where the health comes from or at least begin to identify its roots, and so what do I do? Do I blame God? Well, that doesn't seem like it's gonna lead me in a, in a, in a very positive direction. Do I blame my family? No way, I love them very much. I'm so thankful 
to have been a part of my family. I'm not going to blame them. Do I just throw my hands up and say, it is what it is. Everybody else has just got to deal with it. And this is just my, my plight in life. No. Do I make excuses? No. Because blame shifting is as old as sin, literally. And it doesn't lead to a healthy place. Excuses in my life have only ever led, led me to emotional, spiritual, and relational isolation. So excuses weren't the right path. Jesus says it like this in Matthew 7. He says, how can you say to your brother, let, let me take the speck out of your own eye when all of the time there's a plank in your eye? What Jesus is saying is that the, when there's something growing out of your mind and out of your face, that when people bump into it, it, it hurts. That it's defining and it's the, what you see the world through. Until you deal with that, then the chances of you being helpful to others are, are pretty small. And so excuses didn't seem to be the way for me. And does all this information help explain me to me? Yeah, of course it does. It helps me understand, but information alone is not breakthrough. It's just information. Helpful, but in and of itself is not break, breakthrough. We can be as self-informed as we want, but that's not the same thing as self-denial. And self-denial is exactly what Jesus Christ has called us to. Jesus says this in Matthew 16, he said, Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now, self-denial is not about punishing yourself. It's not about ignoring yourself. Self-denial is an invitation to surrender. And I cannot surrender what I don't know I'm holding on to. I cannot lay down what I don't realize that I've picked up. Surrendering unto Jesus is saying that I trust you in every facet of my life, including all of my thoughts, and I want you to be the Lord over all of it. Surrendering unto Jesus and, and following Jesus, one of the things that you'll learn quickly is that Jesus, man, he's good, isn't he? He never speaks condemnation. He just doesn't speak condemnation, but what Jesus does is he gives us an invitation. And I want you to hear in Matthew 11, Jesus' invitation to you and to me today. Jesus says this, come to me, all who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and do what? Learn from me. Does it happen overnight? It happens over time. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. God loves us, church, and Jesus Christ is the proof, amen? Trusting Jesus as the Lord over every part of our life is to say, God, I receive and believe your love for me. The most important question we'll ask, one of the most important questions we'll ever ask and answer and do this on a daily level, level is, how willing am I to believe and receive the truth that God loves me? Letting God love the crevices and the cracks and the broken places of me and letting him lavish his love over me and me believing that through the power of the gospel, this is where health and healing and growth begins to come. This shadow self at work is the accumulation of untamed emotions. It's less than pure motives and thoughts that why largely unconscious, they strongly influence and shape our behaviors. It is the damaged but mostly hidden version of who we are. And our shadow can reveal itself through sinful behavior and through patterns of self-destructive decisions. But our shadow may simply reveal itself through unhealthy behaviors like being self-defensive or passive-aggressive or generally distrusting for others. Shadow or the weeds, whichever word you want to use, is not simply another word for sin. It is almost always identified through the way we try to protect ourselves from feeling vulnerable or exposed. I've learned in my life that there are certain behaviors that, that show up and when they do, they begin to reveal to me that the shadow self is hard at work. A couple of these are like when I act out inappropriately under pressure. Like if my wife comes home and, or I get home and my wife's like, hey, did you pay that bill today? And my response to her is, no, what do you think I've been doing all day? You think I've just been sitting around playing tiddlywinks? No, I got stuff to do. Well, sorry to be disappointing. All she did was ask me, did you pay the bill? My response is inappropriate, why? Because I feel disappointed in me regularly. And anywhere I bump into the idea that someone else would also feel disappointed in me, my, my response is inappropriate. See, it's not just an interaction, there's something going on beneath 
beneath the surface, when I'm triggered by a, a person or a circumstance and say things that I later regret, when I disregard my spouse or a coworker when they bring up a dif- difficult issue about me or about my behavior, when I keep doing the same things over and over and over again, even though the consequences remain negative, when I do and say things out of a fear of what people might think, when I get busy rather than more reflective when I feel anxious, when I make negative comments to others about those who frustrate me rather than go to them directly. These are all things that when these behaviors happen, they begin to tell me that there's some things going on underneath the surface that I need to pay attention to. That there's some weeds growing in my life that are, that are choking out the, the abundant life and the, the who I want to be. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to head toward the close with this. And so here are some things that I've learned along the way that I'm finding to be helpful, that I'm putting in practice. I am not there yet. Let's be very, very clear. I, just like you, am a work in progress. The Holy Spirit is still growing me up. He is still teaching me. And here's the thing about walking with the Holy Spirit is that he doesn't just have the ability to teach us some things. He has the power to teach us all things. And that the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I mean, it it is a 10,000 carat diamond. There is nothing more beautiful in the world than the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it is also the most powerful thing at work in the world. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation for all who hear and believe. And I believe that the, I believe and have experienced the power of the work of gospel, of the gospel of Jesus Christ in my life. And so bringing myself underneath the gospel week after week, day after day, what does that look like? What is the work? We all know this, that healthy, what's easier in our lives, healthy or unhealthy? unhealthy every time. That healthy is hard work. And so what is the work that God has graciously put in my life to help me navigate these feelings and these tendencies and this history that's so, so defining? Well, number one is, is to regularly seek trusted feedback. To seek trusted feedback in the form of counselors. I go to counseling. I've gone to counseling many times. Next week, I'm going to have three mental health professionals on the stage that do this all day, every day, and they're going to unpack these things uh, through an expert lens, which I am not an expert. I'm just a guy who has experiences and is trying to share them. Next week, we'll have experts. Many of these experts I have sat with for many hours to seek trusted feedback, seek mature Christians who are just a little bit further ahead of you in their journey. They've walked some of the things that you've walked through. This is one of the reasons why your active participation in the local church is so necessary in order to live the fullness of the life that God's called you to because we need each other. We need each other and we need to be underneath the gospel of Jesus Christ every week just having God's love lavished on us and reminding reminding ourselves that God's love is the most important thing about us. And so seeking trusted feedback, it matters a ton. The second is to tame your feelings by naming your feelings. Tame your feelings by naming your feelings. What do I mean? Well, it takes a little bit of work. When I, when you, if you were to ask me, Pastor Britt, how are you doing? And I were to say, I'm doing good. What do I mean? What does good mean? It means I'm not doing bad? No, it means way more than that. It means that I'm operating from a place of rest in here and in here. It means the peace of the kingdom of God is at work in my life, that I feel content, that I'm trusting, that I'm experiencing patience. It means way more than I'm just not doing bad. So I've had to learn, it's like driving my life, it, it, like, like driving a car. When I'm driving the car down the road, if, if the tank is full, if none of the dashboard lights are on, then I'm cruising and everything's going just fine. But as soon as that tank gets empty or the lights start to pop up on the dashboard, it begins to reveal to me that something underneath the hood is not as it should be. So when we tame our feelings by naming our feelings, we begin to learn what, what's going on underneath the hood through feelings so that we can step back, we can reassess We can begin to have open and honest conversations with people who can help us to live in and to find and to take a next step toward what health looks like for us. So taming feelings by naming feelings. If I were to just say, I'm tired, what do I mean? Do I just mean that I didn't sleep good last night? No, it means more than that. It means I'm feeling impatient. I'm feeling restless. I'm feeling discontented. I'm feeling frustrated. I'm feeling not good enough. This is all the things that tired means. So doing the work doing the work. The third is seek trusted feedback. Tame your feelings by naming your feelings. 
And you're going to have to put it on the screen because I can't remember it. There you go. <laughs> Engage the past to enjoy the present. I would highly recommend you doing the work of a genogram. Buy Emotionally Healthy Discipleship by Pete Scazzaro. Dig into it. I would highly recommend. Let me ask you this question. If it's true what Jesus said, which it is, that the enemy only comes to steal, kill, and destroy, is it possible that he started trying to kill you 10 generations ago? Is it possible that he tried to start to steal purpose and to steal joy and to steal passion and to steal life from you 10 generations ago? That he was seeding thoughts and behaviors and fueling uh, unhealthy patterns of living, leading that through the generations to take you out? You bet, that's how much he hates you. But the good news is the power of the gospel, one drop of the blood of Jesus Christ can break any chain that exists in our history. It can. It can. Learning to apply the blood of Jesus in our lives is a significant step. Engage, the, engage, the, engage your past in order to enjoy the present. And I, and I know this, look, this is hard work for a lot of us. It's places that we, it's just hard to go there sometimes. And just know that if there's nobody else in the world praying for you, I'm praying for you, that God will meet you in these spaces and you will see his goodness through it all. And then last but not least, identify the negative scripts at work. Identify the negative scripts at work. You remember I shared those two thoughts that were at the foundation and had become the filter of my life. Let me show you how this is working in my life. Uh, the thought number one I had was that suffering and loss is just around the corner. Suffering and loss is just around the corner. The question is, is that understandable based on my experience? Yeah, it is, but I would think this, for sure. Is this most defining of who I am? Not if God is who he says he is. That there is something more powerful at work in me even than my own experiences Suffering and loss is just around the corner. What does the gospel have to say? And we know that for those who love God, which I do by the grace of God, who love God all things, not some things, not the easy things, not only the fun things, not only the fruitful things that you can measure, that all things work together for the good of those who are called and according to his purpose. I don't know exactly how it's going to work, but I believe the God of the gospel, and I believe that somehow all of this tragedy is going to turn into glory, and that somehow all the traumas we experience in this life will be worn as triumph in Jesus' name in the next. If all things are working together for the good of those who are called into his, according to his purpose. And thought number two is an identity statement. Pain is what makes you matter. It's what gives you significance. And here's what I've learned is that pain, while my pain has been as significant as subjective to me, and why it matters that I've gone through these pain, that there's something more important than my pain that makes me matter. It is true that pain makes me matter. It's just not my pain. It's the pain of Jesus Christ on the cross, and it is his life, death, and resurrection that gives me my significance. And the scriptures say it like this, but he, Jesus, was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace, peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. By his wounds, we are being healed. By his wounds, one day we will fully and finally be healed. The good news of the gospel is that in the midst of the highs and the lows and all the, the pressure and all the doubt and all the hard that I could put on myself that I have experienced in my life through situations I didn't create, but for whatever reason, I've lived through them unto the glory of God, that all of these things somehow are working together in my life. And they lead me over and over and over again back to the place where I'm invited to trust Him, to trust Him that he loves me and that he has good things for me. And some days that, that thought that you're trustworthy and you have good for me may be the only thought that I have to, to hold on to, but it's true. I'll close with this. Um, one of my favorite pastors, uh, uh, a man named Charles Haddon Spurgeon, he, he's one of the most influential pastors that's ever lived. And uh, he struggled throughout the course of his life with what he called the melancholy. And he would tell the story about uh, an elderly woman who came to the church late one afternoon. He was on his way out of the office and she came up to the church and knocked on the door. And so he met her and, and she came in and she said, sir, I'm in, a bad, I'm in a bad place and I need help. 
and I have no money. I'm elderly, as you can see. I have no way to make money. Can you please help me pay my rent on my apartment because they're gonna evict me. And if I get evicted, then surely I'm gonna die if I live homelessly. And, and he prays with the woman and he sends her on her way and he says, let me think about it and figure out what we can do. And he takes a minute and he kind of figures out uh, some more about this lady's situation and then, and then figures out a way to be helpful to her. And, and two days later, he goes over to her house and he knocks on the door and nobody comes to the door. And he comes back the next day and he knocks on the door and nobody comes to the door and he's like, I know she's home, she's not going anywhere. I, I, why is she not coming to the door? Third day, he knocks on the door, she doesn't come to the door and he, he would scratch his head. He's like, I have this free gift for you to help you. But she didn't come to the door and the next Sunday, he sees her at church and he walk, makes his way through the crowd and he walks over to her and he says, he says, ma'am, I, I came to your house three times this week and I knocked on the door, but you didn't answer. Are you okay? And she, and she sheepishly says, I heard you knocking, but I thought you were the landlord and you were, you were coming to evict me and so I was afraid. So I was hiding in the back because I didn't know it was you. And if I'm honest, this is emotionally how I lived for many, many, many years. The Holy Spirit's knocking on the door of my heart. And he's saying, take a next step. Take a baby step. Take a step. And I'm hiding in the back because I'm afraid of what I might find. Because I'm uh, afraid of what I might uncover. Because I'm afraid of myself. Instead of opening the door and inviting the Holy Spirit in to do surgery in only the way that he could, it, it felt at the time easier for me to hide in fear. But make no mistake about it, that when we allow for faith to have the throne of our heart, God begins to grow good and hope and joy in our lives. The invitation to us all today is to respond to the Holy Spirit. And the truth is, this is just my story and my experience and your experiences are different, but there's no doubt about it. Wherever, whatever journey you've been on in your life, God has a next step for you to take in your relationship with him. He's inviting you deeper into your relationship with yourself and your relationship with him. And you know that we are saved by grace and that it is the grace of God that sustains us. It is the grace of God that grows us. And so by his grace, as the Holy Spirit is stirring you, I wanna invite you to respond today, to take one step. You can't do all of this work today. You can't just leave here and immediately things are gonna change where they need to change. It takes time. It takes time, but what we can do for the next five to seven minutes is to put ourselves underneath the fountain of God's love and receive it and believe it together. We can do that through prayer. All the altars at our campuses are open. I would encourage you to come and pray and to put your body in the posture that you want your life to be in. We're gonna sing and what we're gonna sing over and over and over again is this, these words, God loves us because he does and that's the most important thing about us. And then we're gonna bring, we're gonna respond by bringing our first and best back to him because he gave us his first and best through Jesus. Let me pray for us and then we're gonna respond as the Holy Spirit would lead. Father, we love you, we thank you, we trust you, we need you. We pray that right now that you would be glorified as you meet with us and we open ourselves to you. Father, I pray that where the fear may be at work, that you would set us free and unleash faith. We pray that we're where um, anything is growing in our lives that need to be identified, Holy Spirit, we invite you to get in there so that you can weed that out and you can begin to, to help us to grow in health. And uh, Father, I pray that more than anything that you would remind us, that you would comfort us with the reality that you love us and that you are and that is the most important thing about us. Help us to believe it and receive it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Would you stand with me as we respond?